you know, did you get the invite or like the audition back, you know, in the late eighties to, you know, become the bass player for the Lynch Mob? How did that all come about? Well, I had auditioned for this band that was on Atlantic Records, mm-hmm. and um, it, they actually chose. It was like one of the only auditions I ever did that um, I didn't get, and uh, it, I, I, I was beaten out by Phil Stusson for it. And mm-hmm. um, and they had asked me, like, Phil had to go back to LA and mm-hmm. pack his things up to move to New York and whatnot. So they were like, "Can you help us audition drummers?" In the meantime, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, no problem." So I helped. Them. And then the publicist at the time for Atlantic Records, that was the label they were on, yeah. was like, you know, let, let me help you out, you know. Like, and, and she came to see the band. I was in a band that was managed by Tony Bon Jovi, and like, you know, we lived and worked at Power Station, he owned mm-hmm. Power Station Studios, and and um, so we did a gig at the China Club in New York, and she came and saw the gig and she's like you know you're really good and i don't know about your band but you're really good let me help you and she got me a bunch of auditions and lynch mob was one of them so and how did the do you remember like the audition like how did it go down did the guys like you or you know well it was mixed birthday weekend Mm -hmm. and robbie crane was actually auditioning the day before me so he stayed over because it was Mick's birthday and everybody was at Mick's house. It seemed like LA just came to Arizona for that weekend for his birthday party. So it was this massive birthday party. And I had gotten a cassette of them auditioning somebody else. So I kind of already knew what I was going to play right. for the audition. So um, Mick kept touching the bass. He's like, well, this is the deal. You know, I'll show you the songs. And then we'll go down to the rehearsal room with George and Oni, and we'll jam it out. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. I'm like, enjoy your birthday party. Meanwhile, I knew I knew the songs already because I had the tape. Mm-hmm. So every like hour, he was like, dude, come on, let me show you the songs. It's going to be a waste of my time if you don't know the songs. If we leave my party, we go we go to the rehearsal room, and and you don't know the song. I'm like, don't worry, I'm a fast learner. I'll just get it. You know, no problem. And then, and then, so he never showed me the songs, and we eventually ended up going down to the rehearsal room, and I knew the songs already, so they thought I was like this magical bass player that knew what was coming next in the song, and I think (laughs) one of the songs was Wicked, and one of the songs was Sweet Sister Mercy, Mm -hmm. I think maybe, maybe No Better Roses, and we we jammed a little bit, and they were just like blown away that like I didn't know the songs or they thought i didn't know the songs right. yet i didn't make any mistakes and i was going automatically to the changes of the <laughs> <part>. <laughs> like psychically you know, probably uh, had like the big eyes during the audition like what the yeah, hell yeah, I and i got the gig and, and uh then i went back to new york packed up my things to arizona and we wrote we wrote the wicked record who, who broke the news to you that hey you know you got the gig who, who's the one that told you um, they kind of hijacked me, uh-huh. and they, they brought me to a table. We used to always stay at the Scottsdale Princess Hotel, which is like this beautiful five-star hotel. Mm-hmm. And they sat me down at the table, and they're like, we got good news and we got bad news. And I'm like, okay, well, give me the bad, uh, give me the good news first. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, you got every audition in L.A. that you took, so everybody wants you so i was like all right well that's good i don't have to bust tables anymore <laughs> <laughs> and then and then i'm like all right well what's the bad news and like the bad news is that you're uh you're gonna be able to play with us and uh you're gonna be an equal member everything's split equally songwriting publishing merch everything's equal split nice. and uh you're the new member of the lynch mob the last piece and so that's how they told me. Well, um, two 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 points I wanted that you had brought up. That I actually wanted to ask you. Um, I remember the very first time I seen Lynch Mob was 2011 at the Key Club when uh, when the Key Club was still around in Hollywood, and George had announced to the audience that uh, Robbie Crane, you know, was playing with them. Mick was back with them for the first time, and you know 20 years or whatever and he had said that was supposed to be the original original lynch mob but robbie was kind of too wild so they axed him and then anthony came in so yeah, it's uh, a audition the day before me and i got the kick ah okay uh, uh, you can ask robbie too he'll tell you I mean, the, the truth is george likes to spin things 
mm-hmm. whenever he has a new product coming out that he wants to sell. So he kind of like embellishes the truth, mm-hmm. you know, like he's doing it now with the new record that they just released being amazing and all, you know, it's like, I heard it. That ain't amazing. Right. And, and it's like, you know, he, he's, he's got to promote his product. Right so that people will be excited to come see it. Right. So, and I called him on that. And I'm like, what the fuck, dude? That's not the original lineup. I right. was the original bass player. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. And he apologized. He's like, I'm really sorry. I'm just trying to promote this thing and, and get people to come see it. Well, how, oh, how the hell are people supposed to come see it when he's the only guy in the band? You know, it's it's there's no, there's well, no credibility I mean, honestly, there. Honestly, there's no lynch mob after 92. After the second record, lynch mob died. And, um, I mean, he should have called it just George or George Lynch. Or I, I told him he should call it George Lynch's cash grab because that's mm-hmm. all it is. Yeah. Is a cash grab. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like, I'm using the name. It's not woke. Then it's woke. I'm going to do Electric Freedom. And, oh, okay. Well, I'm not getting the money for the gigs. With Lynch, without Lynch Bob on the marquee, so suddenly it's not woke any, you know, it's not. Well, I, you know, I, I was, I was gonna ask, did did he go woke because? Um, oh my God, he's as fucking far left and progressive as there is. Okay. And I'm, I'm a fucking Republican, so right. he and I butt heads on that all the time. But you had mentioned another thing about how you know uh, Lynch Mob, everything was split equally, you know, right down the middle of the merch, the publishing, and all that. So back in 89 so did you actually own 25 percent of the name you make oni and george when it was first on, on paper i did on, on paper um I, but i was young and stupid and I'm going to well if so, it was it was on paper technically you you didn't own it or what, what how did that no i did i did but when the money in when it was divided up it wasn't really done properly uh-huh. and uh there's issues, and I've discussed it with George, and I have a lawyer now and all that to try to get some of that money that was mine back from back then. But on paper it was, but we had a band corporation, mm-hmm. and all the monies was paid into the band corporation. Mm-hmm. And certain members would take money out without other people knowing it. You know? all right, that made that makes sense because I was I was gonna say if you know if everything was split down the middle. So did you end up eventually uh, selling your share to George or no. had? No. You never did? Nope. So technically, you're still a rightful owner then. Of that. There was something There was something that happened when I went back to the Revolution record, uh-huh. and we did that D- D-Tunes record where we redid a couple of Lynch Mob songs, a couple of Dawkins songs, and mm-hmm. I think we did one original on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was with Robert singing. Mm-hmm. And um, I think at that point in time, something was discussed about George completely owning the name. Mm-hmm. But I don't remember signing anything. Um, you know, like, that's the stipulate. Those are the, you just hit on the two stipulation points of what, if we were going to ever reunite, what I need to be addressed before I would even consider doing it Man. would be once, one, some sort of payment on back old money right. and then the other thing would be that the band name go back to only george and myself mm-hmm. so that george can't use it with all these mediocre lineups and he's really abused the name over the years well yeah i mean it's reduced to you know a, a cover band at this point um i was gonna I say mean, what, how many bass players how many singers it's like 35 bass players and, you know you know you know, you know the, singers and, the funny thing is about you know 10 years ago when i um i had seen it for a second time in 2014 and it was a revolving door of musicians back then and i was like well shit maybe i should uh throw my name in the hat you know try to audition send them a tape or something because they if go you through were, if you work cheap you'd get the gig <laughs> yeah they go through members left and right but i was gonna say um if you know my, my joke is my joke is yeah i went to home people yesterday to buy lumber and five guys that said they played bass and lynch mob helped me load the wood in the back of my pickup truck. <laughs> well, how much is, do you think he's paying, you know, the singer and everyone a gig? I mean, Jimmy might, Jimmy DeAnda might get a little bit more of the, the, the loot. Yeah, I would hope so. Um, I, I have no idea, but I know it's not a lot. <laughs> but, um, so... It's are, a lot less than only an I would command. Being, being the owner 
well, one of the you know owners on paper of the name. I mean, aren't you getting royalties for every gig that he's doing under that name? No, I don't do shit. The only thing I get now is I straightened away the publishing and uh, the songwriting copyrights to my to be paid directly to myself, my share. So mm-hmm. that's the only money I see is on the, and that's minimal. I mean. What do we get paid like? What, what do we get played like five times a week on Sirius? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's I'm not going to pay my mortgage with it. Let's put it that way. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I noticed. You know, George has kind of put it out there for well, well, really the last decade and a half. That I mean, he's involved in so many different projects as a fan. It's hard to get behind any of it because he's not touring behind any of it. You know, the KXM and the Sweet and Lynch and the TNN and uh, whatever KXM's else. KXM's the only one that's good. I mean, yeah, if he would have continued, I don't understand. I mean, you had. Well, he can't because Ray's touring with Corn and Ray's not going to tour with Corn. I mean, but if they got another drummer and, and he and Doug, I think he and Doug are the draw. Mm-hmm. So if him and Doug went out, but, but I don't think Doug doesn't want to do it. You know, like. I don't know, and or maybe there's not money there because KXM on the marquee is not worth as much as Lynchbob is. Yeah. He's all about making money. So yeah. I mean, a bit business wise, it makes sense, but for me, it's like, well, what's the point of you know putting out the records? He doesn't do anything for his fans. It's not, you know, what I mean, he's not. The fans want the fucking original lineup. Yeah. He's, and I and I fucking went back when it was ten years ago. Mm-hmm. And it was the 25th anniversary. Mm-hmm. I called everybody. I called Omi. I called Mick. I called George. I called even the road crew. That was our Wicked Sensation road crew. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, let's go back in the studio with Max Norman and make the follow-up to Wicked that we should have made. Mm-hmm. Let's release that and go out and just play Wicked, the album Wicked, and a couple of new songs off the new thing. Let's tour the world once and let's mm-hmm. put it to rest. Yeah. And everybody wanted to do it except for George because he knew that was his cash cow for the future years. Well, I mean, wouldn't he have made more cash, you know, with the original and promoting it to the original? No, because he's got to cut his in. You know, he's paying, he's paying his band peanuts. Well, of course he has to cut. Well, of course he has to cut. With us, he's got to split it equally. And, you know, he's going to get less money. Um, yeah, but... Yes and no, because if it's the original, I mean, technically that commands more money. So instead of getting paid, what, 3000 a gig, wouldn't he have gotten paid himself individual yeah, but, share? But, but I'm telling you, the reason why is because he foresaw the next 10 years later uh, of him being the only guy to make the money. Okay. okay so he didn't want to bury it and be done with it. And, and, you know, it's a shame because it would have been a monster record. I know how we work. And, and I know how when it's the four of us... I would have loved for Mick to have done it. Mm. And I, I know how it is when the four of us are in a room mm. and we're creating shit. Mm. Like, George and only like to make it sound like they did everything and shit. But Mick wrote a lot of those fucking choruses. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what, you know, I, I always say the proof is in the pudding. Look at all the shit that came out under the name Lynchbob after it wasn't us. Yeah. And it's all mediocre at best. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, uh, in the 1990, the Wicked record, you know, you were credited as a songwriter on five of those songs, and the 92 self-titled album, you guys were all credited as all writers of, of that record, and then, um, so after the 92 record and the tour with with Robert, See, Nate, okay, as far as the liner notes on liner notes on the record, mm-hmm. like I was, like I said, I was 22, mm-hmm. I was greener than. The grass in center field in Yankee Stadium on opening day. <laughs> I did not know anything about the biz side. Right. So I was like, I don't care how they write it up. As long as I'm getting 25% of everything, what's the point? Like, mm-hmm. I don't really care. Right. But then everybody that pays out goes through those liner notes. And regardless of what it says on the paper, what the split is, mm-hmm. that's the way they paid out. And I have to chase more money. You know, it's like... right. But but in the in the second record though you were credited on every song with the exception of the Tiger Mother Down cover, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, that I, was also the record that George turned around and said, "Listen, I'm not splitting publishing equally." And you know, there's an interview with Keith Olsen uh-huh. who produced it who said this as well. He said, "I want fifty percent of the publishing, and you guys can split the rest." Is that why? He went solo in 93 and there wasn't a third Lynch Mob album? 
He went solo. He did Sacred Groove. Mm -hmm. We couldn't tour. Tangled in the Red was like top 15 in the country. And we were sitting at home because he was doing that stupid Sacred Groove record. And I told him, I'm like, Eddie never needed to do a solo album. What the fuck are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm like, is there any time in this band that we tell you no, we don't want to do that idea? Right. Like, so what do you need a fucking solo album for? Right. And it was just another George Lynch cash grab. He wanted the money. He wanted the advance. He wanted everything for himself. Mm -hmm. And 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 it detracted. We should have been on the road promoting Tangled in the Web because it was on the charts. Right. And here we are sitting, waiting for him to be done tracking that stupid solo album that nobody gives a fuck about. Yeah, the only people that care about that are, stu are guitar players. Right. I mean, I'm a guitar player, and I don't give two shits about it. But um, there you go. You know, I mean, so we had a number of top fifteen songs in the country, and we're sitting at, in our houses waiting for him to finish recording and mix that stupid thing, and and we missed the window of opportunity. You know. So before um, the record came out, or after the record came out, is when he said he wanted 50% of the publishing. No, while we were in the studio, he sat us all down with Keith mm -hmm. and said, I want 50% of the publishing, and I'm getting 50% of the publishing, and you guys could split up the rest of it, figure out how you did it. And Robert got the short end of the stick, because Mick and I, like, I think, got 20% each. Like, I gave 5% to Robert. Of my 25 and Mick gave 5% and then whatever minimal stuff that that Keith got paid on which he did a lot mm. like so so I mean you know we got I think I went from 25 to 20 or 18 or something like that and then and same with Mick even though we wrote like all of it you know like it's just he he demanded it and, and that was the way it went you know is there um you know, was there an ultimatum? If you don't give me 50%, I'm closing the project right now. Or? No, I, you know what I told him? I was like, listen, dude, you know what? You were in Dockin when I was studying fucking geometry in sophomore year in high school. Mm -hmm. So I get it. And a lot of these records are being sold because you did do Dockin and you built up this following. And, I, you know, I'm reaping rewards off of shit that I didn't fucking work at. And, you know, like, I get it. Okay, this record, okay, no problem. Had it been a third album, I would have argued, let's go back to the fucking original equal split shit but i was like okay you know what you did all this work when i was fucking you know like going to fucking high school football games and hanging out right. like I, I i get it you know well i mean why did why did mick agree to that then because of everything you just said mick also did too so well that's you have to ask mick that <laughs> well i i do i do have one question um I don't know if you know anything about this because I've never asked anyone, but I seen Don Dockin. He was doing a solo acoustic show. This was back in San Juan Capistrano in 2011 at the Coach House. And, you know, Don likes to talk a lot, I noticed. And uh, it was my family and another family. We were backstage with him. And I think he was working with a guy named Kelly King, King or if you've ever heard of him. No, but, but go ahead. Yeah, but okay, so... Basically, Don kept saying that George had put a gun to Mick's head. He kept saying that, he kept saying that. And so I asked him, I said, like, figuratively? He's like, no, he legitimately put a gun to Mick's head and told Mick, if you don't sign this, what I'm assuming was a, you know, a music thing, then I'm going to blow your fucking head off. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> oh. Well, I always am honest, and I remembered something being said about that in the past. Okay. And, we'll and I don't know, it was like at Mick's house in Arizona, and it went down, and, and I don't think it was in regards to Lynch Mob Publishing, mm -hmm. I think it was in regards to Dockin Publishing, mm -hmm. because Dockin was the same thing, where uh, a lot of the publishing, the liner notes split wasn't exactly the way that the band split was, mm -hmm. and Mick was like Nick was losing all this money and he was going to contest it and George confronted him that way but I don't know I, I, I was you know like I heard I wasn't there so I can't give you first hand knowledge of it okay. know? but that was all about docking publishing splits and, and George didn't want to have to give back money or whatever and, you know that kind of shit and at, at this point george had already been at a dock and i'm assuming right this is after 97 i don't know i don't, I don't know i, I like there was a, I, it might have been when they went 
back to Dokken and did Shadow Life or whatever that fucking stupid record's called. <laughs> Dis- maybe Dysfunction. I don't know. Who cares? But yeah. it was. A- it might have been after. <laughs> Because we did, uh, we got back together and we did the Stizzy and that was ninety. I was gonna, I was, Probably. yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you how did that come about? Well, um, after I quit, Electra saw it as a window of opportunity to drop Lynch Mob. I mean, we had like a seven album deal it was for a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So when I quit, they saw the Seattle movement going, and they saw it as an opportunity bounce the band so they dropped the band and syzygy was an ep way of us getting back together with the original members to shop for another deal and then we were going to do another record and then we were going to tour on it we were going to do this syzygy thing and then we were going to tour on it to show Mm -hmm. that we could do business still on the road right to show a label that we could still sell tickets and we could still sell shirts and whatnot blah 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 Mm -hmm. so um then Nick first only said I'm not doing the tour mm. and then and then George went to Robert and asked him and Robert was like no I'm not interested in always being the second call behind Oni mm-hmm. and then and then um so literally and then Nick said Nick said he's going back to docking mm-hmm. and um so it was just George and I and literally we had like two days before the first show mm-hmm. in Phoenix and I'm driving around hearing advertisements for the show, and we don't have a drummer or a stinger. Right. And it's two days away. <laughs> so we had somebody recommended this fucking clown guy, John West, and we fucking hated him. And that's why he never did anything after that tour. But he came in, and he's like, oh, I sing like Ray Gillen, and I know Lynch Mob inside out, and blah, blah, blah. So he came in, he was recommended by somebody. He came in. And he, he was pretty much saved the tour. And then I grabbed Bob Gray, who's my drummer in this band I had called Pizza Team in New York. Right. And Bob, Bob played drums. And it was like, so we did like two rehearsals and played the first gig. You know? Damn, uh, going for broke right there, Anthony. Because <laughs> we had this whole run book to support uh, Revolution, uh, Revol- no, not Revolution, the Scissors. Yeah. So, like so then after the Sizzigy thing, um, then the he thing was like two thousand one. Yeah, he did smoke this, and he used the Lynch Mob name for that. I mean, were you invited to that or? Well, after that tour, after we got off the Sizzigy EP tour, um, I called him and I was like, I had all these ideas about singers that we should get to do the new record. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, I got these young kids, and they're like all sleeping on my couch and stuff. And Pesco's involved, and Donna's guitar player, and I'm doing this new thing, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's going to be the new Lynch Mob record. And I was like, you fucking doing it without me, like. And that's how I found out about it, and that was the Lynch Biscuit record. And, and uh, I'm so glad that I wasn't involved. Because I would have been screaming my ass off. This sucks at rehearsal every day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I seen uh I think that was his attempt at going mainstream to compete with Corn and Lincoln Park just to kind of be relevant. Um Lynch Biscuit was big. He wanted to be Lynch Biscuit and the whole thing was like I heard at the New York show when they played mm-hmm. people were literally lighting the fucking t-shirts on fire and throwing them at the stage. That's how bad they were. Yeah, it's um when you're known for something to completely cross over and do something like that, I mean, I guess he made an attempt, but again, to use the lynch mob name, that was never going to work, you know? Lynch mob he is... He should have used the lynch mob name after 92. Like, it should have been, like, he's the one that started, I always want a band, I want an equal split, I want this, I want that, yet he was the first one to fire Oni, and he's the first one to, like... And I was telling him, I'm like, dude, you know what? Listen. Every time we do an interview, because George and I would do all the interviews, like Nick right. like, would very rarely do them, and only never did them. Yeah. And so, like George and I would sit there in the conference room at Electra Records, and they would long up like twenty five interviews in one day, and it would be around Robin, you know. Right. And the first fucking question was always, "When are you going back to Docking?" And I'm like, "So we replaced Robert 
uh, we replaced only with Robert mm -hmm. and then uh, we were touring on the second record and he had finished Secret Groove and he's like I want to get a new singer for the third record I'm not happy with Robert and I was like listen bro you have two options or I'm quitting first option is get Oni back get him vocal lessons and let's go back to the original lineup or keep Robert and work out whatever it is that's bothering you which I can't imagine anything was right um uh, just figure out what it is, address it, and work on it, and go forward with Robert. I'm not interested in a third album with a third singer that looks like the George Lynch Dock and Side Project. <laughs> I'm like, you were the one who said it's a band, and that's why I chose initially to be part of it. I could have been a hired member with a lot higher paying gigs than being in Lynch Mob. And it's like, I chose this because it was a band, and it was all for one, one for all, four guys against the world. Mm -hmm. And we made a monster record. Mm -hmm. And you keep changing the fucking ground that we're standing on. And I'm not interested in, in another singer, a third singer on a third album. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, we could steal Ray Gillen from Badlands, or we could get Glenn Hughes to come in and sing on it because he sang all the backups on the fucking second record mm -hmm. and like like you know and i was like dude i'm not interested like like and that was it and that's why i quit that was the reason why i quit what year was that 92 93 92 93 yeah because i was going to ask you after the sacred group solo record i mean was there any plans to continue lynch mob for 94 tour 94 sacred group was simultaneous with lynch mob too you know, like it was like it was happening. I told you we couldn't tour on Tangled because he was doing that record. Right. And then we were we gasped a sigh of relief when he was finally fucking done with it. Mm. And we could focus on our band that was like, you know, doing well. And, and uh, I, you know, so it was like he was scattered. And, and we focused on that, and I don't know if there was plans, because I told him, I guess there was plans to do a third record, because he was talking about another singer on it. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I was like, I'm not interested if another new singer. I'm like, you either go back to Oni, or you, you work it out with Robert, but there's no more changes. I don't want another singer. It's not. Right. Every step is getting further away from what we started out to be. Right. So I wanted to, I wanted to say two things. Um. When I was a kid, you know, there was always, you know, that Dokken or George Lynch, what side are you on? And of course, me being a guitar player, um, I was always, you know, Team Lynch. But as I got older, a little wiser and started listening to Don Dokken, started listening to George Lynch, I, I kind of started to think like, well, maybe George isn't this, you know, superhero after all. And George Lynch is my favorite guitar player. He is a superhero at what he does well. And I used to always tell George, just play guitar. Don't direct the videos, don't do the artwork, don't fucking try to manage it, don't try to be the band, the booking agent, just play guitar. Get out of your own fucking way and just play guitar. You're an incredible guitar player, Amazing. you do things on guitar that no one else can do, just play guitar. And then he would, like, go off and he can't get out of his own way, like, that's, that's the reason why, like, Zach's playing in front of thousands of people a night, and George is playing in front of hundreds of people a night. Yeah. Because he doesn't know how to get out of his own way. Yeah. That was why Eddie was Eddie. That was why, you, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, the that was my mantra. The, con the constant experimenting that he does, too, again, as a guitar player. I'm, you know, kind of tone driven, but if I find something that works, I'm going to stick to it. And he's constantly changing things. I never understood that. It's like you have an amazing sound. Uh, I remember we at a... One, we did one night, we like, we did a gig uh -huh. where we swapped out his tender prints behind our stacks and mic'd it up. Uh -huh. And he was like, oh my God, my tone was awesome tonight. And this thing, Ralph, the sound guy, walked him behind the stacks and showed him what he was playing to, and he was shocked. George's tone is in his hands. Yeah. And it's like, whatever he plays to, it's going to sound like fucking George. Right. And, like, this holy grail of tone, this chase that mm -hmm. he's been doing for 50 years, mm -hmm. is, like, kind of like, it, 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 you know, 85% of his tone is in his hands. It right. doesn't matter what he picks up, what right. guitar he picks up, what fucking amp he picks up. It's still going to sound like fucking George. Right. What 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 amp? You said Fender. What? It was like a Princeton or something like that. A little pra a little practice amp. <laughs> yeah, and we, we mic'd it up, and and that was his tone for the night. And Ralph, <laughs> and it, you know, it, it's like his tone is in, is, it's all in his hands. Yeah. I mean, he's a great guitar player. Like, 
but he can't get out of his own way. He makes the dumbest decision. Look at this fucking, look at what he's done to this band yeah. in the past 20 years. I remember seeing an interview on Sleaze Rock that you did um, talking about the the 30th anniversary, I believe it was, the reimagining of Wicked Sensation. Oh God. And I, I thought, they would smoke this. <laughs> yeah, I, I listened to it and I knew immediately it was going to suck, but I, I listened to it and of course it did. I said, well, no, why not get Anthony and, and Mick back for the record, you know, to as a celebration of 30 years? I, I always thought you were the most underrated member. You know, George and, and Mick came from Dawkins, so naturally they were going to be very popular. Oni was the lead singer, so he was going to get attention. But you were, a, you know, you were a main member of that band, an original member, but you also contributed. You know, you weren't just a bass player. You were a songwriter in that band, too. And I always thought that you were a little bit underrated and underappreciated. But to me, you know, Lynch Mob is Anthony, George, Mick, and Oni. You know, and if you I, keep... had, I had a lot of say, like, I, I mean, I, I, I put in, I, you know, like I said, let's go back, I'm young. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had some say in the writing and stuff. I, I definitely picked my spots and put my stamp on it, you know, mm -hmm. like like the fucking solo section of a million years. You know, I was a jazz guy, punk guy coming mm -hmm. out of New York. I didn't know metal. I never played in a metal band. And, and, uh, so I was like, my biggest input on the band was how we looked and mm -hmm. how we, like, like the, the clothes we wore and the mm -hmm. way the videos looked. And we were trying not to be a metal band. And right. I was like, look, if you want to make timeless music, you got to look timeless. Yeah. Throw out your spandex pants, throw out your ripped t-shirts, throw out your wrestling sneakers and burn them. Yeah. Like those are all dated 80 shit. Yeah. If you want fucking timeless, you dress timeless. You, and, and that's when the whole look changed. Yeah. You know? And uh, I didn't want it to be Dawkins. I would have never played in Dawkins. I never wanted to be in Dawkins. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, 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 Lynch Mob was different. I wanted to make it more like like the cult was, like Badlands was. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, like they're, they're timeless. They're not... 80s metal bands. Right. Know? Well, I did want to. I did want to mention too. So you mentioned about the look. I was actually watching uh, you guys play. I think it was like the ABC special in '91. I believe it was. That was the last gig only ever did. Yeah, and, and I remember. Um, I actually told my daughter. I say, "Hey, look at the look at the bass player Anthony." I noticed even in the video, the Wicked Sensation video, you had a lot of sex appeal going on, man. Like your, you know, your hair is flying up everywhere. <laughs> You know, the fan is, like, hitting you. You know, you're moving and well, grooving. I was, guy, I was known as the guy with the fan or the guy with the belt because I had that, that. My buddy, Philippe, like, I grew up, all my friends in New York were all, like, fashion photographers or stylists or whatever. But, so I had two older brothers that, by proxy, this guy, Antoine, who's from, from London, and this guy, Philippe, from Paris. And they taught, they taught me how to dress, and they taught me what's cool, and they mm -hmm. taught me, like, you know, the image and all that. And Philippe gave me that belt is a 1970s motorcycle cop's kidney belt. Mm -hmm. And it's stamped. And I was like, he's like, wear this. I was like, really? You want me to wear this big fucking belt? It's like a heavy metal girdle. Yeah. And he's like, wear it. And it became like my signature with the fan blowing the hair and the, and the belt. It was like, When we, the first gig, the first real gig we did was uh, KNAC's 10th anniversary party for that big rock station mm -hmm. in LA. And the bill was Allison Chains was on first, mm -hmm. LA Guns was on second, we were on third, and then Ozzy was on fourth. And then after Ozzy played, there was this all star jam with the guys from Guns and Kiss and Metallica, and everybody got up because. It was such a big station that everybody was kissing their ass to get played. Right. So I remember in the dressing room, Tracy Guns coming back in the dressing room and going to George. Man, that was cool. I had no idea you guys were so dark and, and like moody and mysterious. And it's like if you listen to songs like Hell Child or She's Evil or like we we really lived and strived in that mid tempo stuff. I mean Street Fighting Man's a good fast tune but most of wicked sensation even wicked or river of love they're not up tempo songs right and it's like we kind of lived in that that sexy we used to call it moroccan roll that that spin off of the potently bounce mm -hmm. that dun, 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 you know yeah and and work off of that keep it mid -tempo, keep it sexy 
and that's what we built on. You know, it wasn't like docking. We weren't trying to be docking. You know? We were trying to blow docking away. Yeah, I, I noticed, well, it's completely different than docking, that's for sure. And I know that you guys only played two docking songs. I think it was uh, Tooth and Nail and uh, Mr. Scary, I think, were the only. No, we played a lot. When we first went out and we were headlining, we only had one album. Mm -hmm. So we had to throw a lot of docking in there. You know, we used to go and chain the night. We did It's Not Love. We did, I mean, we did all, like, because we had to fill time. And right. Why do, why do cover songs when half the band was in a multi-platinum act. Right. It's stupid to go out of the box and, oh, we're going to do a Zeppelin cover. You know, like, what's the point of that? You right. Know? I, I, you know, I noticed too, you had mentioned earlier about, you know, when George got rid of Oni and I, and again, Kiss of Death, by the way, was my favorite Docker song. But Kiss of Death? Kiss of Death and Mr. Scary. Yeah. And was... I played them differently than Jeff did. Yeah. My right hand did different patterns than Jeff was playing. Oh, nice, nice. I was going to ask you, when I was a kid, I had read interviews. I, I first discovered Lynch Mob, you know, when I was just a teenager, you know, back in the early 2000s. And um, the first ever Lynch Mob song I heard was Sweet Sister Mercy, and I thought it was the greatest thing. But I had I had read interviews or, or little... There's that Bo Diddley Bounce again. It, it, right on the intro that time. Yeah. You know, that, that's, where we, that's where we lived. We lived mid-tempo, Bo Diddley Bounce, Moroccan Roll, Haji Goes to Hades is what George used to call it. Like, yeah. It was that vibe, that... that that we, you know, we weren't straight eight, straight eighth notes on the bass. Kind of, we weren't that kind of band. You know? Right, right. Well, I was going to ask. Um, I had heard that one of the reasons why George fired Oni is because Oni was intimidated opening up for you know Jeffrey Tate every night for Queens White, and yeah, um, we went from Queens right to, to Cinderella, and you're mm -hmm. going from Tate to Kiefer. Kiefer. Those two guys do not fuck around both of them are the consummate pros and they don't ever drop a note you never hear them crack mm -hmm. and uh i don't think i think only was in the same boat as me when we were young and i mean he's only a little bit older than me mm -hmm. and and it was like we're, we were put in this position with two guys that are 13 george is 13 years older than me mm -hmm. and and like well, most people didn't realize that that there's a 13 year difference between George and I, right. and and we were thrown into this thing where, yeah, it's a new band, but we didn't we didn't play clubs like we didn't like start from ground zero. We started from docking, being multi platinum, multi times, and we're plugged into this thing with expectations and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Oni was intimidated. I honestly believe that the problem with Oni is he did not know how to warm up for shows. And if you ever watch us, even on that silly three-song TV show, mm -hmm. he struggles with the first song, mm -hmm. and then after his throat opens up, and he's, he, he, he's breathing, and mm -hmm. then he's awesome. And I don't think, I think the problem with Oni Live was he never knew how to warm up correctly and hit the ground running from the first note of his set. Right. It took him like a song or two to get in his comfort zone and then he was fucking incredible but mm -hmm. like you know first impression is the first song and you know you're a new band and you're opening for queen trike or you're opening for cinderella you're opening for all these big bands mm -hmm. and you know you, that first impression is it, the, the biggest thing is how you start a set and how you end the set right I mean, the, the first impression sets the mood for the whole fucking set. And then how you leave them with that last note, that last song, that last, uh, you know, like, like I always used to say, like, with, with his solos, George, he always finishes like Mike Tyson. Like, he always has that flurry at the end that he always ends on the sweet note. And it's like that fucking right cross that Tyson just fucking pins on your jaw and you don't get up. Right. And so he ends his solos that way. We wanted to end our set that way, the same way, you know? So we'd end with like street fight, man, and just assault people with the double kick and all that. And so then... Oh, the last year you were in Lynch Mob was it two thousand three or because I know Revolution Live came out in two thousand six. What was the last year you were in Lynch Mob? The last thing I did was I think it was like two thousand two was the run we did on Revolution, mm -hmm. and um, I was dating this girl, and we had played the Key Club on that run where they did they recorded the live show, mm -hmm. and and there was a girl in front of me and I met her. And I sort of uh, 
ended it with the girl I was dating at the time and started with this other girl. And the girl that I ended it with, uh, George, we had a break and George ended up going to Hawaii with her <laughs> and came back and ended up marrying her. Oh, and that's, that's who he's married to still? Yes. Oh, wow. Um, so I think that kind of had something to do with him dissolving that lineup and... And that was the last time I ever played them. So I, I had I had seen like a an Instagram video where you were in the crowd watching them live, and you had you, <laughs> yeah. Like five minutes of it. I live in the I live in the woods. I got a ten acre horse ranch. And mm-hmm. I have a recording studio on the ranch, and bands come and they stay on the ranch at my house, and I produce them and, and nice. record them. And so I had a recording studio in New York for fifteen years. Nice. That we did. I did the last record I did in New York on my uh, my old studio was Ace's record Anomaly that I did. Yeah. And uh, and then I moved to Pennsylvania. I bought the ranch, so I moved the studio. I kind of had a chicken coop and a three car garage size carriage house, and I made this recording studio on the ranch. So bands come here and they record, and I produce them, and it's all lovely and good but george was playing and i'm friends with jaron the bass player Mm -hmm. because he was in tantric when i recorded tantric here and he's a philly kid and i i you know i i I had a friendship with him before Mm -hmm. he joined lynch mob and um so jaron's like dude we're playing five minutes from your house we're playing the tourist thing are you gonna come so i ended up getting one of the bands that i produced Mm -hmm. This, this amazing man called the War Brothers, mm-hmm. and they're four brothers, two sets of twins, two years apart, mm-hmm. and they they're like Van Halen. The guitar player Zach is sick, and they're just all four of them. The brother, the brotherly thing is great, and so I got them on the bill. I called the guy who books the tour in. I'm like, put the War Brothers on before Lynch Mob. Mm-hmm. So I went down there anyway to see the brothers play. And then I just, you know, I wasn't planning on staying for Lynch Mob. Mm. And then we went, we went to the front bar. We went to the front bar, which is in a separate room from where the bands play. And I was mm-hmm. eating with the brothers. And um, they were like, you should go up and say hi. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay. So I walked up and the security guard goes to me, you're not allowed to be back here. I was like, dude, I wrote three quarters of the fucking songs in the set. Like, I'm, I'm coming in. And it was like sort of like the Jedi mind trick. These are not the drones you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And I kind of walked right by him and I walked to the side of the stage and I went up on first step to the stage and I was watching, they were playing scary. Mm-hmm. And I was just, I was locked into Jimmy. I was looking at Jimmy. Mm-hmm. I love the way Jimmy plays drums. So I was watching Jimmy and I was trying to get his attention and say hi to Jimmy. And that was when George looked down over the end of his neck and that's what happened. He just kind of froze like... <laughs> I, I don't know if, if, if I imagine this or I read this somewhere, but um, all I ever hear is, you know, how George would, you know, challenge Don Doc into a fight every other show. And they were in some physical confrontations before. It's just what happened to where it got really bad between you guys? Like, was it the publishing and the money and all that? And. You know, because no, I, mean, the, I think the, the worst. Well, that was always that. That's been the case for a while. But mm-hmm. we were still talking, and um, we were still texting. And I remember when he did KXM, I texted him, and I was like, I was like, finally, you did something that's above the mediocre bar. Like, <laughs> I thought that record was great. I'm like, you should pursue that because that's the best thing you've got going on. Mm-hmm. And and um, so we were talking, and then. I was on tour with Jake and yeah. we were playing in Japan yeah. and this guy, this guy came up to me and he gave me a copy of Wicked to sign. Mm-hmm. And I looked at it and the album cover colors were off. Yeah. And I was like, ah, oh, bootleg. And he's like, no, no, no bootleg remaster. And I was like, remaster. I'm like Wicked got remastered and I don't, I'm finding out about it this way. Mm-hmm. Like, nobody told me, oh, we're going to remaster our best album ever. Right. Like, so I was shocked. Then he hands me the booklet to sign, and I noticed that my pictures were all taken off of the artwork. It was just him and Oni. Right. So I got pissed off about that. So I call him up, and he had been on Eddie Trunk show when I called him. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, I turned to Jake. I go, is this fucked up? He goes, and it's fucked up. And I called, so I called George straight away from Japan, and I was like, I can't believe you took my fucking pictures off the album. Like, like, why? Why would you do that? And like, it's so fucked up. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, he swore that, like, for a guy that, like, like always goes artwork and like like he's hands on on everything. For him to not know that the label was gonna put it out without Nick and I's photo on mm-hmm. it, and and he had like Eddie Trunk. He was on Eddie Trunk at the time when I called him. I mm-hmm. said like, look, bro, I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna fucking open your head up with a pipe if I see you. You better stop fucking trying to cut me out of everything. I was a member and I did have input, yeah. and I was an active member, and it's fucked up. And, um, and, and, uh, I don't know what, how he responded. He's very, uh, he backs up when I, when I come at him and, and, um, so then they started talking about me on the Eddie Trunk show about how there's a problem there or whatnot. And, and like, they made it all about money. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what are you talking about money? Like, like, it's not about money. You took my photo off the album. Mm-hmm. And Eddie, I knew really well because he's best friends with Ace. Right. And when I was playing with Ace, I would always talk to Eddie on what, what he thought, how, you know, how, you know, like, I had a, I, Ace used to listen to what I said. He would ask my opinion on things. He would, like, he trusted me. Mm-hmm. So I would always bounce it off Eddie, you know, because Eddie knows, nobody knows Ace better than Eddie. And they're best friends. Yeah. So I was like, I called Eddie and I'm like, you know me better than that. You know, why didn't you defend me? Like you knew it wasn't about the money. How would you, how would Ace and Peter feel like it? If Gene and Paul reissued Destroyer and took Ace and Peter off the cover. I wouldn't be surprised if they did do that, to be honest. No, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fucking living. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what did it? That was like the last time that was... That was 2019. Mm-hmm. Well, whenever that album came out, we mastered. I don't know. Well, well that's 2015 or yeah. 2019 or something. That's actually why I, I, I messaged you on social media. It's it, Again, it's funny you bring up signing a record because I have a, a Lynch Mob um, Wicked Sensation record hanging up on my wall, and I have it signed by Mick George and Oni. And I said, I said, shit, I need to, you know, get this signed by Anthony. I, well, what's Anthony doing? Anything you want. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 so that's why that's why I messaged you because I was wondering this, like, okay, well, the last band that I knew Anthony was in was, you know, there was Ace, and then there was the Red Dragon Cartel with um, Jakey e. Lee. So I was like, I'm still in that. We're just waiting. Jake Jake has carpal tunnel syndrome. Oh. He needs on his right wrist, and he needs the operation. So so we're like just we're in a holding pattern until he gets it all sorted out with what doctor's going to do it and what the cost is going to be where the payment for you know all that bullshit and and it's just we're waiting for him to do the operation and then see how he rehabs before we know if we're going forward but that's the band i'm in right now we've just been dormant for four years yeah i mean we the last gig we did was tokyo in 2019 and then COVID hit 20, 20, 20 and 21 mm-hmm. and we had a tour of spring tour booked for 2020 mm-hmm. and that got cancelled and then 2021 at the end he finds out he's got carpal tunnel oh, and man. it's been like a year trying to sort out doctors and, I mean you're talking about Jake Lee's wrist yeah. you know that's like Picasso's fucking brush hand you know like it, it's not just a fucking you know guy in an office that was on a computer too long right so the, the, who does the operation is important right and so he doesn't want to rush it and botch it and fuck, fuck his plane up right so i mean when we were touring in 2019 he literally wrapped his body with kt tape like a fucking mummy and he wore long sleeves and shit like that so nobody could see all the copper tape he had going on and you know with his back and his wrists so, right I mean, he's a trooper. He went out and did every show and fucking played his ass off. But, you know, like, so that's why that's in a holding pattern, you know? Well, th- this comes just from a purely a fan's curiosity. But, I mean, you played with two of the top guns, you know, 80s guitar players and best guitar players of all time with Jake and George and Ace, too, you know. But, I mean... I also played with Jason Hook when I was in Bullet Boys for a minute. I played with Bumblefoot. I used to jam at Bumblefoot's house when I was in the fifth grade. His mm-hmm. brother played drums, and I would play with Bumblefoot. And then in Pisser, Pisser, the original lineup in Pisser was with Frank and Fortis, the drummer and the guitar player in Guns N' Roses yeah. now. And then Fortis left to go do another thing, and Bumblefoot came in on Pisser. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I have played with guitar heroes. You, you know? you've, you've had your share, for sure. That's, but between Jake and George, which one would you say 
technically, not not I guess in the songwriting, you know, uh, department, but the technical player skill wise, which one you know tops the other? Jake. Jake blows George away. George does one thing really well. Jake does everything really well. Mm. Jake can play funk. Jake can play jazz. Jake can play, Jake can play anything. He's a classically trained musician, a classically trained pianist. Mm -hmm. And he, he, the way he structures things, the way he hears music, the way he approaches music mm -hmm. is completely different than George. Okay. And, and Jake just does everything incredible. Like, uh, it's it, it's it's so nice to work with him, and and it, and like I, I, at fifty six years old, I still learn shit from yeah. him. You know, and it's like you know George does one thing amazingly; he's amazingly great at it. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows him for that one thing. But I mean, if you listen to Patina, there's Dick Dale solo styles on there. There's fucking Iomi shit. There's fucking there's funk shit on there. There's blues on there. I mean, he, he, you know, he'd go from a fucking hollow body Gretsch to a fucking 62 fucking SG mm -hmm. seamlessly, you know, like it's, it's just, he's so well-rounded and he's, he's not a guitar player. He's a musician. He's a musician. And, yeah. and G George is a great guitar player and he's great at what he does, you know, no matter what he plays, yeah. you know, it's always going to sound like George. It's always going to be that thing, but Jake <laughs> can do anything. Like Jake is... He's fucking incredible. He's the best musician I've ever had the privilege of playing. When the cartel eventually does get back on the road, um, I know in the last tour, you know, Jake, you know, said he's not going to play any Aussie songs, but do you think you guys are going to play some Aussie tunes, Bark at the Moon, Shot in the Dark, you know? Well, the, and... the first time I toured with him in 2015 when we were auditioning Singers Live, mm -hmm. we did so much Aussie and so much Badlands because mm -hmm. we only had the first record. Right. And then he only had the first Red Dragon record. And I think we only did like three songs off it. And then the rest were like Ozzy and Badland and stuff. Mm -hmm. Then when we did Patina, I mean, Patina is a fucking great record. And I'm really proud of that record. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, we ended up playing the whole entire Patina album live, except for the ballad, mm -hmm. uh, The Painted Heart. And, um, and so there was less room in the set to put stuff in. And I know he's got a bad taste in his mouth from the Sham and Ozzy thing. <laughs> and he only wanted to play Ozzy songs that weren't ever played live mm -hmm. by Ozzy. So that we did Spiders, which is like the B side, I think, of Bark or some, one of the singles off Bark on the Moon. Right. He, um, so, I mean, would you be? It's entirely, it's entirely his call. It's of his course, song. I would love to play Bark in the Moon with him every fucking night. Yeah. But it's like, you know, it's his call. It's his song. It's right. his band. Right. You know, he's the boss. So if he says, you know, we're going to do fucking, you know, like Grand Funk, we're going to do five songs off the Grand Funk. That's what we're doing. You know? Gotcha, gotcha. Well, okay, so the last two questions, and then I'll let you go here, is... um. I mean, musically, are, are you doing anything right now? Are, are you touring? I'm always doing stuff. I have, like, I'm, I always produce bands. Like, I'm presently working with War Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, they, I don't know how they did it, but they talked me into managing them. So now I'm starting a management company, and we're releasing a three-song EP on a label that I'm starting. And it's all because of them, because they're like, we don't want anybody else. We don't trust anybody else. We want you to manage us. I'm like, oh, okay whatever i'm like i'll do it and <laughs> you know like they're, they're making me do all this shit right. but it's okay it's good to, to, to broaden your horizons but i mean there's like you know i just did a great band from nashville called mm -hmm. tattered sons i did four songs on fourth of july weekend with them and mm -hmm. there's actually on my on my on my facebook page that they made the drummer's a really talented filmmaker mm -hmm. and he made this whole like making of the four song ep film and you could see the studio and you could see the horses and you could see the ranch and yeah you could definitely catch the vibe of, of what i got going on here yeah. and then you know there's a local band lift kit that's a really good country band that I'm, I'm 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 producing now and uh there's i'm always working with other bands um mm -hmm. it's hard to get like it's hard, it's hard to get older, like more like established bands to mm -hmm. come to Pennsylvania because they, they want to do it cheap and they're kind of, you know, they'll go on like frontiers and, you know, it's like pump a record out in three weekends kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Make records that way, yeah. you know. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds divine to me, brother. And again, I appreciate you even taking the time to talk to me. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, and, and uh, this, like, means the world to me, so I really, really appreciate that. Are, are you going to be at the NAMM show in, in the upcoming NAMM show? I, 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 I'm just so like I have all my doors. I'm an Ampeg, mm -hmm. I'm Fender, I'm DR Strings now. I was Dean Markley forever. Mm -hmm. And then and then Dean sold the company to a conglomerate and he dropped me. And then DR picked me up like a week later. It's like I, I don't really need to go to Schmooze to get what I need. Like I'd rather go to the AES convention where it's all the recording shit than go yeah. to the show. Yeah, that makes you know? sense. But all right, Anthony, hey, thank you. I, I really appreciate it and I'm definitely gonna be in touch, so